Welcome to week two of CST 8215, even though technically it's lecture one for you guys, because uh, you guys were happy doing your happy orientation last week. And this class was late enough, they could have made you go to class, but they said, no, you don't have class anyway, so whatever. It's all good. All right. Now, what I usually start with, I explain to you who I am and why you should listen to me. I'm not saying I'm better than other profs, but I usually try to explain why you want to listen to me. I graduated from college in 1996. Notice I said the word college, not university. I'm in the same, I came from the same kind of boat as you guys are in now. Canada College in the 90s was well known for its IT programs. Then things happened and they're not so well known for it anymore because they canceled every, all of them. But you know, back then they were well known for a very rounded program. And essentially, two weeks after I graduated, I had a job just to show you that the industry exists. I've been working ever since. Uh, with, I think, longest lapse of unemployment I had was two weeks. So there's lots of jobs in IT. You just got to be willing to find them and work to get them. Now, I work full time and I teach part time. Now, what does that mean for you guys? It means a few different things. Uh, number one, I don't have office hours. Because if I'm not in the classroom with you guys, I'm either at my day job or sleeping. Because between the two, it's a 50 to 60 hour week. So there's not a lot of extra time. Look at the next line. Okay. There are other implications that go with that. It also means that I tend to make my stuff easy to grade. Which means it's usually easy to understand what I want out of you. My goals are very clear and obvious. I don't use one of those fa fuzzy rubrics to grade you the one to four. Oh, I guess you're somewhere like a 3.2. Either you got it or you didn't. My world's very black and white and that's how it is once you get out of school. So I figured I should get you guys used to the concept of yes, you achieved the goal. No, you didn't. Go do it again. I currently work for a company called Catlink Technology Corporation. In this room, there's probably one of you that knows who that is because they did a co-op there a couple, uh, about a year and a half ago. Yay for them. Um, we are a small company, 40 odd employees. I've been there for 18 years. Been, we've been around for a bit. We make software for sign making. Everybody, most people don't even know there's such an industry as sign making. So, billboards, yeah, we know how to make the software that runs those printers that print those big billboards. Uh, design to cut laser engrave, et cetera, et cetera, that's all us. Um, we've got a finger in pretty much every pie of the industry and we actually have almost a controlling percentage in some of them, which is great. All right. What kind of person am I? Actually, so more about that. I'm a full stack developer at this location for this company. In other words, I, does, I do everything from the database design work all the way to the front end development. So when you hear about full stack developer jobs, that's me. So be it setting up an Apache server, designing a database, implementing the database, writing the PHP back end, the HTML front end, and all the wonderful Ajax and XML RPC calls in between, that's, I do that for a living. As well as fixed PCs for the company because apparently they gave me that job too. Because you know I just don't have enough to do in my day. So what kind of person am I? All right, I have a loose and easy going teaching style. I. The closest thing to lecture notes you're going to get is these slides. I've been doing this stuff for so long, not just teaching, but working with databases for so long that I don't need a set of convoluted teaching notes as I teach each lecture. Um, essentially, I know what I'm going to cover that day, and I cover it. And my lecture style is pretty loose, as in if people ask me questions, sometimes the lecture will deviate a little bit to expand upon what people are interested in. So it's a very organic experience for everyone involved. I've been told that I'm sarcastic. Um, I've also been told by students I'm particularly savage. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, normally in every group there's always three or four guys that stand out and that like being picked on. I can't say anything about their personality but they actually enjoy being picked on. And they basically volunteer for the job. Uh, you know, whatever. I'm okay to work with those kinds of people. Um, 
I also understand that life happens. I had a really crappy summer. Things went horribly wrong in my household for a while this summer. Therefore, I understand that life happens and, you know, school is not always number one priority. By the same token, I don't suffer fools in the sense of, you tell me, oh, my uncle passed away. And a week, two weeks later, you tell me again, your uncle passed away. Oh, what, is that the same uncle? No, it's the other uncle. How many uncles do you have? Two. Three weeks later, my uncle passed away. You think I'm joking. I'm actually using this as an example of something that's actually happened. They were using this as an excuse why they couldn't hand in their work. You know, or my dog died. Little did I know, they actually had, did have five dogs. You know, but the only, only one passed away, but they had five, actually five dogs. They kept using that excuse. Things happen. Uh, you get sick, you end up in the hospital. That's okay. Not okay that you're in the hospital. It's okay. I'm not going to ride you. Um, just, you know, if life happens, let me know with a reasonable amount of time. Not two minutes before that anything is due because there's nothing I can do to help you at that point. But, you know, give me a bit of warning. Like, you, if you know bad shit's happening, you know, and things are due in like three days, let me know. And I can probably work with it. Um, I've also been told I'm an equally equal opportunity offender. Unfortunately, I'm not very PC. I try my best to be PC. I really do. Apparently, I'm not very good at it. Uh, and I apologize now if I offend anyone. I figured I'd come up front and apologize ahead of time. Uh, but if I do say something that really makes you want to cry, just take me out after class. Not take me out literally, but meet me out in the hall and have a chat with me about whatever it is, and I'll make a, a specific point to avoid that topic in the future or that particular kind of example. Because I've learned over the years, sometimes there's a few things that you just shouldn't say. You know, just because it worked for four years and suddenly you offend one person, that's all it takes. So you've got to be careful. Okay, there is a recommended textbook. Now, please note the phrase recommended. It is not required. And depending on how they decide to tack it on to your tuition, you may or may not have paid for this book. We do when it's recommended, you don't have to pay for it. Yes? Yeah, it's required at level two. Oh, no, it says yeah, it's on the course outline, it says it's recommended. Oh. Even on, if you even take the course outline, you can show them it says it's recommended, it's not required. Yeah, no, it's recommended. Even the course outline says requ uh, recommended. Maybe the person that placed the order made a mistake on the checkbox. I don't know. However, since it's... Re actually, no, for you guys, you don't need it again. That's why it's recommended. For the CP students, it's required. You guys are in CT, right? You don't have a level 2 database course. Those guys do, and they use this book. The good news is... Oh, I can't say that while it's being recorded, but there's ways to get copies. <laughs> um, you know, out, uh, out on the internet, you know, where the genesis is. Yes, exactly. Uh, there's places. Um, so, as you will see, there are recommended, there is recommended reading in the weekly uh, CSI. You don't need it. Honestly, you don't need it. I don't have any course material based on this book per se. It's just give you a second source of information that covers the material in a slightly different way than I do. So if my words don't work for you, maybe those words will work for you. Or if I talk too fast, because I do, you know, you'll have a chance to actually catch up to a formally written book that is on its 15th edition. It's been around for a while. It's actually not a bad book. The only thing bad about it is the price tag. 200. Okay, they've given you guys a disc because you get the digital copy. Yeah, or it's free. All right, Dan's rules for success in CSD 215. Okay, come to lecture. However, I don't take attendance. I suck at remembering names. I guarantee. By the end of this term, I'll remember maybe 10 names out of this whole group. It's not because I don't care. I even get my kids' names wrong. My youngest is 18. 
And I still get her wrong. I call her by her cat's name every once in a while. But I never forget a voice, and I never forget a face. So I'll know who you are, I just don't know your, per, your identifiable designation. So I suck at it. I'm sorry, we all have to deal with it. Um, but I'm going to talk about the little camera that's on the go in a minute, which is why the attendance I don't take. Um, success rule number two, do your work. You'd be surprised how often that phrase seems to not mean anything, especially to high school students that just graduated last year. <sighs> this isn't high school. I can give you zeros, and I will give it to you with a smile. I will not shed a tear over work not done. All you did is give me less work. Hand in your work on time. That's just like real life. You get a job, your boss says, have this done by Friday. Guess what he wants by Friday? He wants the job done. Unless you have a really good reason for it to be late. Like your dog died for the third time. Now, I do allow some flexibility knowing, especially this is level one and people are freshly into the college experience. I allow you one week of late time. So what that means is you get an extra week after it's due, you take a 10% penalty off the top. So if the assignment's out of 50, five off the top. So you'll never have 100% if you're late. But you were late. And I give lots of time. Twelve oh one PM you're late. Brightspace tells me how many minutes late you are. Way back to that's the one feature of Brightspace I like over Blackboard. It tells me down to the minute how late you were for a piece of work. Sometimes, you know, five minutes late, I just ignore it. F five hours late, it starts getting a little sketchy. You know, that's a that's you know, you might as well be doing handing in the next day at that point. Okay. If you are more than two weeks late, it's an automatic zero. I literally will go through and just go zero, 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 zero all the way down for everybody who's late. Like I said, you're going to make my life easy if I don't have to grade it. Ah, uh, shoot, I forgot to update my slides again. If you don't hear me assign it in class, then it's not due. Um, historically, the LMS we were using, this was a while back, but I keep this line in there just for argument's sake, would randomly change due dates on things. Why? We don't know. Um, I've had some interesting experiences with dates in Brightspace already. Uh, not that it changed my dates on me, as in I made something due and then it nagged everyone even after it was graded. So it's, it's a little aggressive on the nagging. Um, labs are not due by the start of the next lecture. Labs are due by the next Friday. That slide's wrong. In other words, a la last week's lab is due this Friday. This week's lab will be due next Friday. So you have a week and a half, roughly, to do every lab. That is more than adequate, considering most of these labs can be done in less than two hours. Yes. Yes. Okay. Late labs normally are an automatic zero. You've been given a week and a half to do less than two hours worth of work and you actually have a two-hour block of time allocated in your life already for it. There's not a lot I can do for that. Okay, what can you expect this term? Lectures, labs, assignment tests, and a two-part exam. It sounds pretty much like every other course except maybe the two-part exam. In actual fact, I think for the Java course, they've gone to a two-part exam now also. Thanks to me. It was my idea. Uh, I was the first one to implement it. You have a practical applied exam and then an actual theory exam. At least I was the first one in this program. They've done it in other parts of the school, but I was the first one in this program to offer that. That means I take your exam and split in half. So instead of sitting down and doing a monstrous exam for two hours, you do two smaller exams over four hours, but not at the same time. They're actually a week apart. So I actually reduce your, your stress level a little bit by spreading it out a bit. Labs are gradual. Oh, sorry, lectures are free from, I already covered that. I don't need to talk about this. Labs are gradual and peak difficulty around week nine, which it should be. It'll go like this, and then it'll level off, and then there's lab 10, which is more or less optional. 
Um, and I forgot to get rid of the word blackboard as it shows here. It's supposed to say Brightspace. Uh, assignments are submitted via Brightspace. You have at least two weeks. My assignments are never brutal. There's no excuse to be late. Um, I even give you guys an, an entire week of work periods, as in lecture period is a work period, lab is a work period. So the, the week after I assign the assignment, I give the entire week of no lectures or labs so that you have time to work at it in class. Tests are going to be online. And you have a week. They take about an hour or so. Again, no excuse. Literally, it's open book. You sit down, you do a test. You search through all the documents and you take the best guesses you can. Anywhere you want. I try to trust you guys that you're not sitting there in a little group up in the corner going, hee hee, what'd you get for question number two? <laughs> Just saying that you think I haven't seen this, because I have. It's not locked to the school. You can go to the residence. You can go home. You can even do it from the Starbucks if you want. I don't care. I do unlock it so you can't do it during the lecture or the day it's being released. So it becomes available as soon as the lecture is done. So that you're not sitting there through the lecture and asking me questions that are totally not rele relevant to the exam. Because that's happened where I caught myself going, I'm answering questions, well, that's nothing to do with what I'm talking about. Sneaky. Okay, lecture recording. I try. It's a value-added service, and it's not a guarantee. I do all the rendering and the editing out of class time. I don't get paid for anything I do outside of class time. You'll see the editing is very rough, as in I slap a title on it. And sometimes you'll see me make a weird mark on the board. That's because I said something really stupid that should never be published on the internet. You see me put a little diamond on the board? Usually you'll hear everybody laughing just before I put the diamond on the board because Dan said something really inappropriate. Okay? Um, usually it shows up on YouTube within one or two days. I am using a brand new software editing suite this term, so I'm not sure how long all this is going to take compared to how I used to do it. And I actually do it. There's a YouTube channel. Every lecture for my last three years are on there. So you have previous versions of this course. You also have Introduction to Linux, which is a level two course. 8102, all my lectures for that is, are there too. And my lecture is CST8250, which is the level two database course for IAWDs there also. There's all kinds of lectures there for you to feel free to dig at. You can see how much my style has changed over the years. I can't say the quality got better, but the style changed. Uh, at least the audio has gotten significantly better in the last year and a half. Okay, what will you be learning this term? Basic database design. You will not be experts when you leave here. Not even close. However, you will know enough to be dangerous. Yeah, you know, a little bit of knowledge versus lots of knowledge. Yeah, you'll know enough to understand when people are talking to you. You'll know enough to start out at a job as a junior. So you can, you have, you'll have the basic groundwork of all the understanding that you need. The problem with 8215, especially for the CET students, because you only have one required database course, is when I was in college, I took four database courses in my program. I'm cramming the contents of three of those into one term. Right? So there's not going to be a lot of depth. It's a lot of breadth. So you're going to learn a bit about everything. You'll have a good founding. And, you know, after that, you'll be ready to learn more about database on your own. You'll know enough to learn on your own after this. I've already had students tell me my course got them a job. Because they're able to mimic my words. So, you know, just saying. Uh, the database course is actually apparently a job finder, even for the CET students. So it's worth paying attention in this class. Um, what else are you going to learn? SQL, that's the language you use to talk to databases. Um, views, triggers, stored procedures, and other stuff. The other stuff covers pretty much everything else on the course outline. Um, indexes, partitioning, that kind of crap. 
I don't spend a lot of time on that because personally I don't think it's that important as a level one course to have that material. If you want to know more about it, you can take the next database course because it's an elective for you guys. The level two for CP is an elective in your third term, I think, or fourth term. So you can take the level two course if you choose to. It's your choice. But you'll have enough of a foundation after I'm done with you that you'll be comfortable going into that second level course or even go to the workplace. So, all right, here's how the evaluation works. Labs are 10%. Quizzes, also known as hybrids, are worth 10%. Assignments are 20%. Tests, there's two of them, they're 10% each. It's not that test one is worth 5%, test two is worth 15%, it's 10 and 10. The, pro the exam is broken down into two pieces, a theory exam and a practical exam. The theory exam is 20%. The practical exam is 20%. The theory exam will see you sitting there with a pencil and a scantron sheet crying the entire time. The practical exam will see you with your laptop typing SQL crying the entire time. I'm kidding, it's not that bad. And we give you ins I give you insane amounts of pre preparation for it. Um, the good news is for you guys, this is the last term I'm running this particular practical exam because it's been run for several terms already. Um, but there's a lot of material, practice material for you guys available. All right, so this is what they call a 323 course. Have you heard this kind of acronym yet? Some of you have, some of you have not. Okay, it's three hours of theory. Two hours in class, one hour online, theoretically. The two hours in class is this, me flapping my gums at you in your general direction. The one hour outline online is the hybrids. Uh, if I remember right, I think I've got nine. So somehow you're supposed to do those nine hybrids over 14 hours. Most of those hybrids don't take an hour. Five and six might take you more than an hour. So, you know, it balances out pretty evenly. Yes? Are the done on our own time? They are done on your own time. That's why it's called hybrid online. You just do it whenever you feel comfortable. I do recommend you do them pretty much lockstep with the course. Uh, if you look at the CSI, it'll show you should be doing this hybrid, this hybrid, because the content of the hybrids reflects roughly what we're talking about in class. Yeah? And for a five minute, don't get yeah. Two hours of lab per week. That's when you go to the other classrooms. And three hours of study time. That's supposed to be, you know, the usual stuff you do. Review your notes. Rewatch the lecture. Insert thing here. So, when I said I give you guys lots of time to do your work, I don't actually have assigned homework other than the hybrids. So I don't tell you guys, go home, read these 26 chapters, and then go program these five things. I don't do that. It's basically the work I give you in class is the work you have to do. It's up to you to manage your time. Later. <laughs> I don't know what he said. <laughs> hey, I've had students walk out all the time. I'll just call them out as they go by. <laughs> I guess you closed the door. I was the one that walked out, right? And you forgot to close it. You doubled back. <laughs> all right. So official to pass the course, you must. This is the official. See, notice the quote marks. You must write the final exam, both halves. Uh, because so far, I've only had one student get 100% on the theory exam in the last four years. How many people are in this room right now? 120 registered students. I've done five sections of this. The summer group is smaller. I've done two summer groups at 100 each. So right now, it's like 0.25% get got 100%, roughly. No, not even that. 0.1%? Roughly? I'm, I suck at math in my head. That's why I do database. So, yeah? No, because it's come, questions come from five different profs. There's five prof, five, four? Sorry, four profs. Sorry, four? Hang on. Save. Five of us teaching this right now. There's five lecture sections of 8215. 
We take questions from all five, shuffle them up in a pot, more or less, and assemble an exam. So they may write a question in wording that you've never seen before. So what we'll do is we'll write an exam that has like 200 questions, then we start eliminating questions we don't like. We'll take five I don't like, five the other person doesn't like, and we bring it down to a reasonable number of questions. I don't know what the final number will be this year. But that's how we've been assembling the exams. And so in the end, you'll have an exam that has questions that aren't necessarily just from me, so you'll be getting wording you're not always quite used to seeing. Or, you know, they might use a diagram style that you're not quite comfortable with. You should be comfortable with it because it's pretty much the same as it is, but, you know, Murphy's Law would state sometimes just one different word is enough to throw people off. Yes? Scantron. The computer corrects it for me. So you must get 50% on test and exam combined. In other words, you've got to get 50% on the theory portion, and you must have 50% on the assignments and the group work. Uh, you must submit both assignments. Even if you only get 5%, you must submit it. It's just the rules. I didn't make them. I've been, it's been dictated to me. These are the rules I must follow. And all labs, although I put in the word most, because life happens, and I'd hate to fail a student just because they, you know, were in a hospital with a broken leg, and they couldn't hand in their lab on time. <coughs> okay, supported hardware and software. Windows. Okay. I can support Windows, no problem. Mac users. <sighs> I got nothing to say. Honestly, I got nothing to say about Mac users. Their laptops are cool. They're boat anchors. You know, you're running a real operating system with a candy cane interface on top of it. That's nice. I can't help you. So if you want to run stuff natively on the Mac, knock yourself out. You're on your own. Linux users. Glorious neckbeards. I can absolutely support you. No problem. Whatsoever. That's the tar that's target environment I work against every day. This course, if I could, I'd tell everybody should be just running Linux for this course. It would make my life so much easier. App, get installed, PostgreSQL, enter. Oop, there. App, get installed, this. Oop, there. No. Even easier than Windows. Okay. So that's the introduction of what we're going to be doing in this course. There isn't much more I can say about the leading into this other than we're going to get into the first lecture, which is actually pretty short because I usually keep my first lecture fairly short overall because usually it's in the first week of school and everybody's running around with their heads cut off. Well, it's the second week of school and I thought class was at 5 o'clock today. Why? Because I checked my schedule three weeks ago when I made all the announcements and everything and they had me scheduled for 5. And today I'm sitting there and going, my spidey sense is tingling. Damn. What the hell am I doing home this early? <laughs> I had to go home, right? Get ready to come to class. So, yeah. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Okay, let's go uh, pay a little visit to Brightspace for a second. Come on. I see our uh, Brightspace performance is stellar as always. <sighs> okay. So, as I noted in my announcement, I suck at reading time and I got it wrong. Anyways, there's one thing I wanted to mention about how I don't have required, there's no required textbook. However, I do have a bunch of PDF documents. And it basically goes one per lecture. It would behoove you to either read it before the lecture or right after the lecture. I don't care exactly when you read it, but you should read it the same week as the lecture. Most of them are fairly short and not too painful. Um, as, I, as I said in the labs, um, I mean, this one here is five pages long. Yay. 
uh, unit two is nine pages long. So, yeah, how long should that take you guys to read? 45 minutes, depending on your reading aptitude. There's going to be words in there you don't recognize that will slow you down. Good news is, if anybody needs it in a bigger font, just let me know and I will send you an enlarged font version. As applicable. Um, I've had that request in the past. It just, I'm not 100% sure how to reformat it. <laughs> to make it do that, but I will do my best. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay. On with the show. Okay. So, Unit 1.1. This used to be called Week 1. But guess what? This is Week 2. So I, I decided, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm done numbering my slides after weeks. So we're just going to call them in units instead. And essentially, week one is an introduction to database, as in what is a database, what kind of stuff do you need to learn to be able to work with them. Now, the first thing is what is a data, what is database, as in what is a database, but there's more to it than just a database. Okay, first things first, you have to think about what is data. It's information, basically. Um, <coughs> it's a succinct answer, yes. But a lot of people don't realize just what information means. Like, when you look around yourself and you think about data, for example, let me grab my monstrously large cell phone. Okay, well, it's not the big phablet job, but, you know. And I got my phone in my hand, right? Now, you look at this, there's information we can glean just by looking at it, right? For example... What brand is it? It's a Sony. It's a Sony. I don't want bloatware. Right? It's blue. It's actually blue. It's not black. It's not silver. It's blue. It's a pretty color. I didn't even pay extra for that. You know, it's got a six inch screen. I had a rubber protector with a, with a metal plate so it can stick to the magnet in my car. Clunk on the dash. It's got 4 gigs of RAM, 64 gigs onboard storage, it supports an extra memory card, etc, etc, etc. It has a 23 megapixel camera that sucks ass. <laughs> it can't focus if it life depended on it. You think from Sony, which makes the cameras for every other freaking cell phone out there, they have the best camera. Try the manual yeah, I know, it's terrible. Yeah, uh, well, my wife has the XA1, she has no problems with it compared to this one. So... Yeah, so you'd figure, you know. But that's information you can glean from this. This is all data points. Now, let's think about, you know, when you think about people. Holy crap, there's a lot of data points when you think about people, right? You've got nationality. Let's go with that one. That's safe. <laughs> tell you, you laugh. Nationality. I used to use gender. That's just too freaking loaded now. But, you know, gender, there's, you know, height, weight, eye color, hair color, what, you know, et cetera, et cetera. How many fingers do they have? You'd be surprised. You know, that kind of stuff. Your name, your date of birth. There's stuff that's tangible, like your size. There's stuff that's intangible, like your date of birth. That means nothing. Other than it's a date on a calendar that says, hey, you're a year older this year. Yay, you get to drink now. Yay, you get to go get your driver's license. Yay, you can go to Quebec and drink. You know, that's just the boundaries, right, of the, the age graph, the whole age thing. But those are intangible items as opposed to tangible. This is all data. There's r other data, like when you buy something, you get a receipt. There's data on this receipt. So what is a database? A database is an organized collection of data. Usually, a given database is an organized collection of data on roughly the same related information. So, for example, you've all logged into Access at least once by now, right? That is a database. <laughs> Surprise. That contains information about you. What courses, what classes you're in, who your profs are, what your grades are. On and on and on and on. And for those of you that are curious, it runs on an old, on an old Ingress database, and it's written in COBOL. Don't go, oh. Because you know what? 
They just released a new version of COBOL two years ago. It is the highest paying job right out of school right now. 90,000 bucks a year as a junior. Do not laugh at COBOL. It sucks. You're going to hate your life the entire time, but man, you're going to get paid well. Yeah. It's, it's a programming language and database in one. It's a fourth, they call it fourth generation language. COBOL is a thing. It's out there. C-O-B-O-L. It's an elective later. You can take it later. It's an actual course here at the school. Almost nobody takes it because everybody thinks about it and they want to cry. A lot of people that get it, a lot of profs will talk bad about COBOL because it's COBOL. Um, and it, a, lot of, a lot of people are brainwashed to think COBOL is a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing that pays really well. Oh, I've seen 70, 90,000 starting out. It, it feels like a lot of money. Yeah. But just saying, you know, it is a, a good place to start, yes. It's a programming language and database in one. It's, you'd have to, it's like an entire course. It's, it is a language, it's just what they call a 4GL, where the data access portions of it are built in the database, and the data definition portions of it are also part of the language. It does it all inside itself. It's kind of cool, in its weird, archaic kind of way. Because it's not pretty. Because it was designed for managers to be understandable by non-programmers. It's very verbose. You know, instead of saying x equals 3, you go move 3 into x. Literally, you write the words move and into. So it's a lot of words for not a lot of action. Um, so at this point, as you discuss people, what do you think is a database? What are examples of databases you come across in your everyday life? You can't use Access because I already said it. That is not a database. That's a spreadsheet. Eh? <sighs> like a digital one, or are you talking about a piece of paper? Yeah, if they're doing it on the, uh, through like Brightspace, yes, that'll be a database. Uh, I think you were next. Facebook has a huge database behind it, yes, and they like collecting all your data. They, they were actually able to predict what you want to eat and when you want to eat it because they know so much about you. They actually did some algorithms and they actually were able to predict with 90% that you want to go get a piece of pizza. Because you always want pizza. Hey? Okay? Uh, not usually. Those are flat files. A lot of people think emails are actually database entries, but they're not. They're actually flat files. They actually do take the contents of your email and index it into a database, but not the emails themselves. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a database that contains all the metadata. The actual videos are not in the database. That's a terrible thing to do. Uh, yeah, search engines will be big databases. Okay, how many of you have a phone? I'd be, this is a stupid question, but how many of you actually have a cell phone? All of you, right? Or I should ask who doesn't have a cell phone. Is the uh, if you are running an Android phone, you're, there's a database built in called SQLite. And that's what their contacts are con contained in. Because SQLite runs on Android. Go figure. There are several databases on your phone. Your contacts list, your block lists, all that jazz. It's all built in. We've all experienced databases. You go to the grocery store. And you go, you got your pack of bananas, you stick it on the scale, and you go, 4011. It's the only code I know. 4011 is bananas. And it does a quick lookup. Oh, it's bananas, 47 cents a pound. Put it in the bag. It looked it up against the database. Those are all databases. Now, a bit of history. Data's always been around, obviously. Actually, the first, apparently, first real organized sample of data, of, a da of collected data, actually dates back to pre-Greek times where they did actually find entire uh, surveys of people, basically censuses of people of what they did and how much they had and all that jazz. It's cool. People have been collecting data about other people for, you know, they've been trying to be Mark Zuckerberg for years. <laughs> they just were a lot better at it now than we ever were. Various organization systems have been developed over the years, but essentially it all amounts to it's just a giant box with crap in it. The problem is, is how good is the crap? Now, we've discussed what data is. And some of you, 
God, there's not a lot enough here that are old enough to recognize this. The card file systems in the library. That was before we had computers to find books in the library. That's old school. I spent a lot of detentions typing in cards in high school. Grade 9 was a rough year for Dan. <laughs> but, yeah, th those were how you'd find books. And that was basically, that was a giant database that organized all the books. You had, you know, drawers based on titles, drawers based on topics, and you'd sit there and look up topics, and you'd have a, you'd find, oh, the book at whatever, the decimal number, this is this rip, and we walk out with the card, right? That's why I always had to retype them, because those jackasses. Okay, short history part two. Now, commercial database systems have been around for a long, long time. The very first SQL compliant database system is Oracle. That's why it's still around. They are still making insane amounts of money even though their sales have been flat for four years. Why? Because once you're in an Oracle shop, you can't get away from it. It's like a crazy significant other. There's no getting rid of them. Uh, which is not quite true because things are starting to change finally. Uh, Oracle came along and did it. IBM said that's a great thing. They made one called DB2, which was actually better and more powerful than Oracle, and nobody ever used it. Why? Because you had to buy an IBM mainframe to run it on. Whereas Oracle ran on everything, generally speaking, when computers were the size of this room, it ran on any of those room-sized computers. SQL Server and Sybase, those are on the same line. SQL Server's from Microsoft. Sybase has been bought out a few years ago by Computer Associates, if I remember right. <coughs> In the early 90s, there was a product called Whatcom SQL. Whatcom SQL came from the University of Waterloo. Waterloo Computer Department, Whatcom. And they had a data, an SQL server that they'd created. And they were tired of dealing with it. So they offered it out for sale. Microsoft says, we want to buy it. And this little startup called Sybase says, we want it too. So they said to each other, you know what? We'll agree to both buy it at the same time. Microsoft says, we'll just release it for Windows. Sybase will only release it for Unix platforms. We'll each play in our own little sandbox. Version 5.5 .5 comes out from Microsoft. It, what does it run on? Windows and Unix. Sybase comes out. What does it run on? Windows and Unix. That partnership lasted all of a year. Knives came out and they went... <laughs> now, who won in this one? It's hard to say. Realistically, because Microsoft is still pumping out SQL Server, a new version every year or two. Sybase was pumping out new versions every couple of years until they got bought out by Computer Associates. Computer Associates is still releasing versions of their database. Uh, anybody here ever hear of PeopleSoft or SAP? SAP runs on, Sy on a Sybase backend. Yeah. yeah, they're all terrible. Um, so they were basically for until version 8 or so, they were actually binary compatible with each other. You could actually take the raw database files from one server, from Sybase, put it on the SQL server, and they'd work. That's how compatible they were. They were just making the interfaces better and not changing the back end. And then after that, it, it diverged dramatically. Um, Sybase, you know, was great. It did what it did. My Scroft SQL server does what it does. And enough said there. Uh, then there was DBase and Access. That's called, those are des desktop level ones. DBase still exists, shockingly enough. They just released a new version not long ago. It's basically to keep all those old DOS systems still working. Uh, access is access, and it should be buried in a pit. And never to see the light of day again. Um, it has gotten much better in recent times, but it's still a terrible product. Uh, it lets you do all kinds of things you should never do with a database. Typical Microsoft. Um, on the other hand, there's the open source field. There's MySQL. MySQL exists everywhere. It's like athlete's foot. It does the job. It spreads. Everybody knows how to use it. At least anybody who does web development knows how to deal with it. It doesn't mean it's a good thing. 
It just means it's ever, and by the way, MySQL is owned by Oracle now. MySQL stopped progressing when Oracle bought them. Go figure that one out. I wonder why. And it got forked off to another product called MariaDB. So now you've got two versions of MySQL that aren't compatible with each other anymore. Great times. But it's everywhere. So if you get a web hosting package, if anybody here has ever set up, bought a web hosting package, you get MySQL included for the ride. They all give you MySQL. It's like going to the Nepean Sportsplex and not wearing shoes. You'll get it whether you want it or not. PostgreSQL, which is the one that is used for this course. Postgres has a very colorful history. Um, you know, there's a university in California, I don't remember which one, I'm pretty sure it's Berkeley, had a product called Ingress. And you've already heard me say the word Ingress today because the school runs on Ingress. And after a while they said, oh, we're done with this, we'll open source our database. They threw it out in the wild. Have source code world and you figure it out yourselves. So they said, well, we can't call this Ingress anymore, so we'll call it Postgres. You know, Ingress, Postgres, real cute. And then one guy said, you know what we really need, though? We need needs SQL because Ingress and Postgres originally did not have SQL. So they threw, they tacked on SQL, so it became PostgreSQL. Let's not try to make this something pronounceable. So it became Postgres. People just assume it does SQL now. They're right now on version 10.5-ish. Uh, they're in betas for version 11. It is the most advanced open source database server on the market, bar none. It is the number one choice for people dumping Oracle. Why? Because there's an, an extension for it that makes it 99% compatible with Oracle. At least for the data types and its stored procedures. None of the server-side configuration type stuff, but you can actually port your database directly and it'll work most of the time. It is also used for most mapping engines. So you know the guys on the third floor that you know, walk around in their little army fatigues? They're taking the geo mapping course for the military. They're using Postgres with GI the GIS extensions. Uh, GIS is Global Information System, or Geographic Information System. It allows you to map. Um, Postgres has the most data types available to you. They've got a, it's got a data type for everything, and then some. And you hear about people that talk about, oh yeah, MongoDB, best thing on earth. No. Or, you know, big SQL this, or, you know, whatever, insert thing here. Postgres can do all of that. It supports all the same leaf node structures as all the other guys, but it does it in a sane manner. Um, it is the, also, surprisingly, the most traveled database in the world. There's a Postgres database on the ISS. There's no MySQL up there, but Postgres made it. That tells you something about stability. Um, Postgres runs on everything. At one point, I actually found an Android version. I could run it on my phone just for shits and giggles. It was absolutely unusable, but it worked. It supports every major processor architecture back to the original 80, uh, sorry, uh, 6,800, uh, 68,000 processors, the power PCs. It supports everything. You could run it on your, on your, on your like Mac 7s. You know, Mac OS 7? It, ran on, it runs on everything. Um, it small footprint. It follows the rules. It is also the most SQL compliant. Like all the rules of SQL, it's the most compliant of the open source databases. That's why we're using it for this course. For those that are, for a few that ask me, why are we using Postgres and not SQL Server? Um, if you ever tried running SQ, Microsoft SQL Server on your laptop, especially those of you that have a laptop that's not brand new, have, have a good time. Uh, be thankful you don't have to take level 2 database because all those, those poor suckers have to run my, uh, Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle on their laptops. It's a terrible time. Uh, there's a few other open source database servers. There was one called Firebird. Uh, I thought it was dead, but apparently it's not. Uh, SQLite, the world's smallest SQL database. It is an em what they call an embedded SQL database. Um, it is a 300K library. It's a DLL on Windows. You include it in your Windows project. Boom, you have SQL in your, serve, in your, in your software. The company I work for, we use it to, con to keep all our settings because our software has an insane amount of settings, right? I was 
looking at the guy who worked that's for us and he knows exactly what I'm talking about how so many stupid settings the setting of the software has for a graphics package and we actually use an SQLite database to keep all our settings it's easier than actually writing on I files because the yeah, I files would be like a meg which is a little absurd all right so why would you use a database rule number one you'd use it for data storage why? Because that's what it's for. It's designed to let you organize your data in a sane manner. It's designed to let you retrieve the data in a quick and reasonable manner with a standardized language. It allows you to make write reports, which has to do with, if your data is organized right and you can retrieve it, you can do reports. And what kind of reports do you see out of databases? There's a couple of kinds. Mail merges. How many of you have received a personalized letter in the mail recently? You know what somebody didn't sit there and type your name on that, right? They had a database and they went and then it got stuffed in an envelope, dropped off in the mailbox or in the back of a Canada Post truck in this case. That's a mail merge. Where more you used to getting spam mail that's been addressed to you? Frank, we can enhance your performance. Take this creatine, you'll be able to lift more. What did you think I was talking about? <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about, not being PC. <laughs> BI systems. Now, A, eh? business intelligence. Uh, the CP students have this in, as an elective. I'm not sure if you guys do. There's an actual whole course on business intelligence, which is basically fancy reporting. Uh, there was a project called Crystal Reports years ago. And it was a great product. And then Seagate, yes, Seagate, the hard drive people, bought it. And then nothing happened to it for five years. And then they got tired of it and they sold it off. And I don't know what's happened to it, but it kind of sucks now. And then there once was a time in Ottawa with this shining example of data processing company called Cognos. Anybody here remember the name Cognos? One, two, three, four. Yeah, IBM bought them and promptly killed it off. They just basically bought the buildings, occupied them with IBM employees, rebranded everything, it was called Cognos, into Rational this, Rational Rose this or that, and that was the end of the product. Uh, it was one of the best reporting platforms available on the market. Gone. But those are products, what they do is they're set up, they run at night, batch jobs every night, they'll build up little reports with little pictures and graphs, and then it builds up these reports and mails them off to managers so they can sit there and promptly ignore them. Weekly sales numbers, I don't care. I'm going to go ask Bob how we did this week. We'll trust Bob's word over what's actually coming out of the database. Because, you know, Bob really knows what he's doing. Bob doesn't know what he's doing. So, you know, getting ground feel what the Bob feels like it's doing is a good thing, which compared to the real numbers. Because maybe Bob had a really good week and everybody sucked. That's reporting. Um, what kind of other reporting you get out of there? For you guys, you'd have the experience of your grades. That's a form of reporting. At the end of the term, I upload your grades. I hit submit. Three or four days later, you find out what your grades are once the department chair approves them. Then you get a little report that says, this is your grade. And they go, what the frick Dan do to my grade? Well, it's too late now. Maybe you should have done that assignment. Okay. <coughs> now, there's types of databases. There's the flat model. Those are two-dimensional array of data, essentially. Essentially, almost like a spreadsheet. Basically, it's a text file. If ever you've opened up what they call a CSV file, a comma-separated value file, whereas basically it's a bunch of text with commas in between, quotes sometimes to separate words that have spaces or commas in it. Each line is a different record. That is a flat file. Way back in the day, that's what we used. Our programs would read these files, parse them, and output results. And as the day's business would go on, they would just get appended to the end of each daily file, and we'd run all the files, summarize them, add them to the weekly summary. We'd then we'd run all the weekly summaries and add them to the monthly summaries. It was painful. Anybody here try to log into Access after 11 o'clock at night? How'd that work for you? 
Why? Because it's an old COBOL system that's doing its nightly maintenance. It's parsing its flat files, preparing documents to be pushed into all the other systems you guys have access to. So what it does, it runs every night, looking at who's been added to courses, removed from courses, who's dropped out, et cetera, et cetera. And then it builds up output files that are reports, and they get out sent off to the things. So yes, I keep forgetting I can't get into access after 11 o'clock at night. We all have that problem. All right, there's the hierarchical model. It's a tree-like structure similar to a file system. If, you're, if you've seen, you know, you go into Windows users, Mac users, don't even pay attention to me. Windows users, C, then you have, you know, program, program files, x86, users, Windows, and miscellaneous other folders in there. Then you go into each folder and it opens up and then you have files. That's what the hierarchical model was like. It was basically a giant tree structure. And if you wanted to tr have related data, it had to be all under the same leaf. So if you needed the same information on multiple branches, you actually had to copy it. So you had to duplicate data everywhere. Somebody said, that's a cool system. Actually, there actually are is a use for that out there. Uh, but somebody says, okay, we should come up with the something better. So they came up with the network model. Each record is an undivided unit. And each unit is linked to another unit, which means it sounds not intuitive because it's not. So for example, you each have a record that is called student. Then there's a course called CST8215. Your student unit is connected to the course unit. So suddenly you'll have the course unit with a bunch of spider like lines connecting to all these different students. So you end up with all these different units floating all over, all over the place. It also has a very useful purpose, not so good for searching for data, but it was good for building uh, mind maps and, or uh, neural networks. It's still in use today. So when you hear about people working on AI, most of their databases tend to be network model databases, not relational. Which brings me to relational. That's what we're all here for in this class. It's currently the most popular type of database. It's organized in tables, and tables have relationships between them. So for the one that mentioned Excel spreadsheets, imagine in one Excel spreadsheet that has a physical connection to another Excel spreadsheet. And that Excel spreadsheet could be connected to another Excel spreadsheet. Each Excel spreadsheet contains a different kind of data. One could be courses, one could be students, one could be classrooms and it's all interconnected. <laughs> the theory behind this system has been developed in the 60s, developed further in the 70s, slowly developed in the 80s, until it reached a point when I went to school, I'm teaching you the exact same stuff I learned. It hasn't changed since like 95. And I was told that hadn't changed since like, you know, 89 when I was in school. So just to say, it doesn't change very much as you go. Yes? Okay, network model, it treats each individual student as a, as a unit unto itself. So you exist by yourself. You define yourself completely, like you do it in the real world, okay? The dude next to you is a complete unit unto himself also. Everything about him defines him there. If he has extra attributes you don't have, great. They're self-contained within him. But the same token, you're both connected to CST8215. <coughs> CST8215 is a unit unto itself. The relational model is, I've got an entity called student. This entity has a set number of parameters or attributes. Name, SIN number, passport number, insert things here. And each of you are an instance of that. Uh, that's actually my next week's lecture. I'm getting next week's lecture to answer your question. Not quite, but essentially, well, yeah, it's like a class you're thinking about object-oriented programming. But essentially, you have a definition for a student, and everybody's just a record inside of that definition. Whereas in the other case, you're the definition onto yourself. It makes keeping the data organized better, because if his definition is different than your definition, it gets difficult to write code to figure out what pieces you need. <coughs> Relational, everything follows the same rules all the time. So, 
So that's how it's done. Now, I just hit my microphone. That's going to sound great. Database management systems. A DBMS is a piece of software that manages the data in the database. Now, really the acronym has become RDBMS, Relational Database Management System. And depending on which one you use, it comes with extra stuff, extra features. But at its core, it's a piece of software that lets the software, whatever software you're using, interface with the data in the back. It's basically a gatekeeper. Do you ever go to a library and, the, and you walk in with a couple of books and you go to put them back on the shelf? Do you ever see the reactions from the librarians? If you've never seen that, try it. Especially make sure they're paying attention to you before you go put it up on the shelf. I guarantee they're going to be pissed. Essentially, the data of DBMS is the librarian. It takes care of putting the data in the right place for you. You tell it, I need you to check in a new student. Here's the data for the student. It takes care of putting it in the right spot. You don't deal with that stuff at all. That's its job. It must provide a way to define containers, such as tables and records. Great. So you define the containers, whatever method you use. In our case, we're going to use SQL to do it. Other database servers use different languages. There are actually other database languages. They're just so rare that nobody uses them. Should be able to provide search and sort capabilities. Again, SQL. Provides data management tools. That's one part SQL, one part backup tools, one part administration tools. It should enforce integrity rules. In other words, you're not allowed to be a student if you have no courses. Therefore, and a course is not allowed to run without students in the classroom. Therefore, there's rules that say students must be attached to a course or students must have courses. Those are rules. It enforces those rules to make sure that they're followed. Okay, originally database systems were tied to physical media, tapes and spools. Anybody remember, the, ever watch one of the really old movies and you see the tape, the tape drives going as they're searching? It was really challenging to develop against that. Thankfully, that was after my time. I mean, before my time. I'm not that old. Um, it was before my time. And it was pretty terrible because you actually had to write code that knew exactly the length of every record and would roll the tape to the right spot every time you jumped through, which was where the, the hierarchical model, the tree model, worked the best because you could just move down the tape until you hit the right spot. But you also had to take into account how much tape you'd moved because the tape moves faster, the bigger the spool gets, right? How many of you remember cassette tapes? You remember how fast one side goes compared to the other side because of, you know, insert thing here? That's, you know, the same idea, but you know, the spools were that big. And they held all of, you know, a megabyte of data. And then you cried when the tape broke, because invariably they'd break on a regular basis. So development was challenging. The relational model was created by... I usually pull up his name automatically. Um... Cod, C-O-D-D is his last name. I can't remember his first name. As I said earlier, I suck at names. Uh, but Cod was one of the first ones that came up with the relational model. There was actually a couple of other guys. Another fellow called Date, C.J. Date, also came up with a lot of the theory. And they figured out if we create a relational model, we can abstract the design from the physical media. As in, the physical media has nothing to do with the data that's contained on it. So the goal of a relational system is data independence. In other words, the data structure should work no matter where you put it, what you want to run it on. You don't have to code to the fact that the tape moves at a certain speed after so many feet. You just ask for a record 66, and it, doesn't, it just goes and grabs it. That's data independence. That's the goal. Now, because we're worrying about abstracting, it leads us to data modeling. 
because you can't abstract unless you model. And that's going to be the first part of this term. This basically, the way I've got the term broken down is we spend about three, four weeks on data modeling, three, four weeks on SQL, and a couple of weeks on other crap at the end. The other crap's important. It's just not as important as the other stuff. And the data modeling is what we're going to focus on for the next three weeks after today. The data modeling is the process of exploring and creating data-oriented structures. So you're going to learn about how to look at things in the world and create designs that define these things. So you're going to learn how to organize your, your, your data. Now, usually I have fun with this question. How many of you have very neat bedrooms? Like, like clean freak level neat. Like your books must be, you know, all your video games are organized by alphabetical on the shelf. Okay? Okay, you're probably not going to have too hard a time with this. How many of you look like a dog threw up in your room? And you get up and go, ah, that's okay. Yeah, you're going to have a hard time. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you do just fine. <laughs> just the condition of, I'm just saying, usually the ones that are, have really messy environments tend to have very um, loose thought processes. And you're going to have to work a little harder on sorting your stuff out. But sometimes those that have really loose thought processes actually pick up missing details that the really organized guys don't pick up on. So it's different sides of the same coin where you have better skills for some of it, but you're going to have a harder time figuring how things are organized. You got the organization freaks that'll be good at organizing the crap, but they'll miss obvious details. The only reason that we that now is we just move. Okay, well that's not a good excuse. <laughs> we just, everything's like I like my space clean. My office is the cleanest office at Cadlink, by far. Yeah, he's going. Yeah, he worked for us for uh, six months. So yeah, he knows. Yeah, he's been in my office. It's the cleanest office at Cadlink by far. It's neat because I have no crap in my office, and I refuse to let crap happen. But it's about exploring data and creating structures based on this. It focuses on the data and how it's organized. <coughs> now, you think exploring means the same thing as focusing. It's not. You explore as in you go out and you do a walkabout and you look at all the data around you and you collect as much information as possible. And then you go back and then you focus on what you've done and actually organize it. That's the difference. The first step is exploring. The second one is the focus and organizing it. And I'll be honest, I really sucked at it when I started out. It's, it's not an easy first skill to learn, especially in computers. Um, but it's a really good skill to have because it forces you to be structured. And the more structured you are, the better your whole experience will go. It'll make stuff like learning how to program in Java easier if you can structure your thought process. It's the same. Now, part of the data modeling is also determining the NDD types and their relationships. Now, next week I'll be talking specifically about NDD types and that kind of stuff, but as a preliminary, when you talk about data, you've got NDD types, also known as entities, and instances, entity, entity instances, instances. An entity type is a thing. For example, a student is a thing. I'm not saying each of you are things, but a student is a thing. We can determine what defines a student fairly straightforward, right? First name, middle name, last name. Identifying number of some sort, whether it's a SIN number, passport number, student visa number, insert whatever it happens here. <sighs> Gender. There's 33 of them now. Eh? Eh? No, no, that's uh, the Wikipedia page. Gender, um, address, phone number, email address. Et cetera, et cetera. All those pieces of information can be collected, and every one of you will have most of this information. Therefore, you will each have, you'll be slotted into each of these bins. And each of you will have most of this information. Mind you, you know, some people have only two names, and some people have many names. You know, 
you come from a Portuguese or Brazilian or a Portuguese country, Portuguese language country, you'll have lots of names. You come from Quebec, you'll have a bunch of hyphenated names. You know, you come from the Middle East, you'll have the same name many times. <laughs> Depending on where you're from, you're going to have, that's, that wasn't PC, but it's true. It's, I can't say it's insulting, it's just the truth. Right? You could have my name. You know, or you could be a French Catholic where your first name is Joseph, whether or not it is. Because it's automatic. If you're a baptized French Catholic from Canada, your first name is Joseph, whether you want it to be or not. We're all Joseph. Welcome to the club. It's not on my birth certificate, but technically it is according to my baptism certificate. That's just how it is, right? We all have quirks to our names. We all have a date of birth. We all have an identifying number of some sort, no matter where we're from. That's an entity type. A course is an entity type. A course section is an entity type. The relationship would be, there's a course called CST 8215. There's a section called 300. 8215 currently has five sections, right? 300 through 305. Yeah, 305. Each of you are connected to one of these sections. So you guys are connected to 300. So 8215 has five courses. Each of those five courses has, uh, except for 305, has 120 students in each one. There's an awful lot of you database people this term. And that's a relationship, the connection between two entity types. What is an instance, on the other hand? The instance is each of you as a student. You're an instance, you're an instance, you're an instance. We're all instances. Well, I'm not a student. I'm an employee instance. But my defining points are almost exactly the same as yours. So there's three kinds of models when it comes to database. I took off my watch. I want to make sure I'm not going over my time. Oh, hot damn good. I'll be done in 15 minutes. Conceptual models. That's the first type. It is used to visualize data at its highest level. We don't describe the attributes rarely at this point. We just talk about student, course, many to many, done. It's during requirements gathering. It allows you to have simplified communication with your stakeholders. What are stakeholders? Do you guys know what stakeholders are? They're the people that pay you. Or they're the people that pay the people that pay you. Which is even better. Because if people pay the people that pay you, that means you're probably going to get paid. Which is the goal of going to school, right? So essentially, it allows you to give pretty pictures to your customers and make them feel good about what you're doing for them. It allows them to actually understand what, it allows them to know whether or not you understand what their needs are. It's very basic. And one of the hybrids, I believe, covers this stuff. And the doc, the booklets cover it too. Now, it covers the in important entities and the relationships. There are no attributes. There's no primary keys. There's none of that. It's the very most basic. A relationship would be professor, students. So I'd be an entity, professor. You guys are a student. Yay. There's a relationship to between us, that I get to determine your future in this class. It is what it is. After you've done the conceptual, there's something called the logical. It's a more detailed version of this. You take the student entity type, and we start describing it in more detail. It's just like when you start programming. You don't write the entire application in one sitting. You write a little bit of code, you try it out, it works. Yay. You write a little bit more code and you just keep adding to it. That's a logical model. So you take the entity types, you turn them into entities, and they're applicable at relationships. We're going to learn more about this stuff as we go. It's just that this is the high level summary for you guys. Now, here's some key features about the logical model though. All entities and relationships must exist. In other words, you've fully defined everything in the system. All the attributes for each entity are specified. In other words, we're going to describe a student and just saying this is the box that is a student, you're actually going to have a box that has everything that defines a student inside of it. Person's name, date of birth, skip gender, everything else. Right? All these other attributes. 
The primary key for each entity is specified. I'll be talking about primary keys later, but that's just a key attribute of when you define a logical model. Foreign keys are defined. How are things interconnected? Again, I'll be talking about later. And normalization, the best database topic ever. I love teaching about normalization. And then there's the physical data model. This is the actual physical representation of the model. Now, this is where it becomes database specific. So the logical model is a model that will be carried across any database server. It's totally database server agnostic. It doesn't care. The physical model now cares. It specifies all tables and columns. In other words, they're no longer entities, they're no longer attributes, they're actual tables and columns. There's the physical representation. All the foreign keys that actually exist are in a forest. You may need to do some denormalization at this point when you realize that you've went too far in the previous step, because you can. Physical consideration can be quite different, can cause it to be quite different from the logical model. Just because the logical model says it looks like this, doesn't mean physically that's what it's going to look like. Anybody ever try to do something on paper, draw something on paper, then you go out to the garage and you try to build it? How well did that go? Anybody here ever try to assemble IKEA furniture and it never went together quite the way that the pictures, you know the little guy who shows these two things just go boop? And that, you know, you can't understand why there's like this 9 degree turn in this one piece that's not, yeah. Yeah, it's off by one eighth of an inch and you can't get the damn screw in because the factory, the diagram doesn't show you that you're supposed to flip the damn board the other way. It's not obvious. Yeah, but not on the boards themselves. So you start out wrong. Trust me, I assembled an IKEA couch about a month ago. I wanted to cry. When you have to use a pair of vice grips to get that last screw in, because no matter what you do, you can't, it doesn't line up. And I'm like, one screw left, the heck with this. Until I, until I heard this loud pop noise and everything just fit magically. When all else fails, hammer. But that's, you know, that's how... That's the physical side of it, though, is where it gets down to the nuts and bolts, where each database server has its own rules. The data types in Postgres are not the same as the data types in Oracle. They're not the same as they are in Microsoft SQL Server. So the physical model is targeted to the actual target environment. There's still ways to make it fairly portable, but there are actual limitations of what it can do. Or not limitations, but there's rules you have to follow on each server. Okay. Yeah. It's the end of the slideshow. Okay. So, what should you do this week? Okay. Number one, for those of you that have not finished installing lab, there's stuff for lab one. You should do it during this lab period if you're having technical difficulties. I know I've had two students email me saying, it's not working. Okay. Just come and show me in lab. I'm not going to give you a zero. Number two, you can start out in lab two. You can even do it at home if you want. It's actually fairly straightforward. It's a monkey see, monkey do lab. Click here, do this. Click here, do this. Click here, do this. It's fairly straightforward. You should read the PDF for unit 1.1. You should do hybrid 1. And that's it. We're done.